And I want you to use this example of inductor to cover one more fairly important physical concept. It's the idea of energy stored in magnetic field. So let me just remind you of what we have talked about before in terms of energy in electrostatics. So everyone good? OK. So um, I mean, we don't talk about this uh, enough. Um, I mentioned it last time when we did a capacitor. And I'm bringing it up again so that I can introduce a formula and try to make some sense of it. So let me call this energy in um, elect electromagnetism. So the first example is something you have seen before. Imagine I have a parallel plate capacitor. So I have a parallel plate capacitor. Let's say I have some current flowing through this uh, capacitor. There's no actual current flowing through the capacitor, but it looks like it does. Because when you have current coming in, then you have positive charges that are moving into this plate, charging up this plate positively. These positive charges repel the positive charges here. So actually, the same amount of current goes out the other side. So even though there's no physical charge jumping across the capacitor, we would still talk about current through the capacitor, because it looks like it is um, from the outside of the black box. So what you have is that as this plate charges up positively, this plate charges up negatively. Right? And what we looked at last time is you could look at the energy stored here in terms of um, ener look at the energy stored. Um, you can look at it two different ways. You can look at it in terms of voltage. And we took some time deriving this formula for energy stored on the capacitor in terms of voltage. Um, the potential energy stored on the capacitor was 1 half QV. And um, you can go back to your notes, figure out where this factor of 1 half comes from. Right? And another way to look at the amount of energy stored was actually in terms of electric field. Is this sounding familiar? Yes? When you have charges stored on the capacitor, then there's an electric field uh, established within the volume of the capacitor. So there's an electric field here. And what we describe here is the energy density. So um, the energy density, lowercase u, um, of, of this electric field, we derived this expression by considering this example. And the energy density here was 1 half epsilon naught e squared. Ringing a bell? Yes. So you know, last time we, I introduced this, you might have thought, all right, so what are we going to do with this? Um, and this is the reason we introduced it. So in the case of capacitor, you could have easily thought of this in terms of um, energy, in terms of charges. That was easy, and you know, you're done. Like, what else do we need to do? The reason I introduced this at all is so that you would have a point of reference, something to think analogously with when we do magnetism here. Because what I, this is what I want to claim. I want to say, if I have, imagine this is a perfect inductor made with perfect wires with zero resistance. If I have some amount of current flowing through here, which means um, I must have, um, I must have a closed circuit here. Uh, if I have some amount of current flowing through here, I'm going to say there is energy stored in this configuration of a current flowing through an inductor. That if I have, so if I have this setup, let me just draw a picture. Um, so 
if I have this setup, an inductor, with some amount of current flowing through, I could even call it I naught. If I have some amount of static current flowing through, then what I am going to claim is that this setup here, it stores energy. Like, how does the claim make sense? Like, um, so you know, we can, we, you, relying on our um, intuition about conservative forces and potential energy, it's easier for us to think about how there's a stored energy in separated positive and negative charge. Sorry, they look the same. <laughs> Let me say, this is positive charge, this is negative charge. It's easier for us to think, all right, if I have these two charges separated, then there's energy stored here. How do I know that? Well, if I just let go, then these two will attract each other, and you know this potential energy turns into kinetic energy. That's how I know there's energy stored in this setup. Right? Here, what I'm claiming is that in this arrangement, which has some amount of current flowing through a coil, there's no charge separation, there's no ch net charge anywhere. I'm saying that this is um, this configuration actually has to store some amount of energy. Like, what would you look at intuitively to say, um, this is why it stores energy? There's, um, right now, is there a voltage change? Yeah, once I say it's a steady current, then there's no more voltage change, right? So yeah, so this is the part where it's uh, it's you know not intuitive um, when you look at it. So so um, so if we are looking at it right now, I would say well, right now the voltage difference from this end to this end, delta v is equal to zero. How do I know that? I connected these two points with a piece of wire to complete the circuit. So there's no voltage change there. But I'm still going to say this setup somehow stores energy. Here's a one way to think about it. Um, when you imagine this setup and try changing something about this setup, and if you, you know, kind of imagine that, that is actually not an easy thing to do. I'm not saying that it's not easy to imagine, although that may be true. <laughs> what I'm saying is that uh, when you imagine changing something, there are other things you have to change alongside. For example, so right now, you know, there's no actual current flowing through here, but you are just imagining this is some kind of superconductor, so there's some steady current here. Nothing is actually powering the current right now, but it's still flowing. Imagine what happens the moment I try to disconnect this. So the moment this comes off, what happens? Okay, I'm trying to break the circuit, which means I'm trying to make the current go to zero. So now I'm changing the current. The moment I try to change the current here, what happens? Magnetic field is changing. Faraday's law kicks in, so what happens? there's now going to be voltage induced. In fact, um, you can see this with any electric drill. If you look at the side of the, or any large motor, if you look at the side of it, when you start it, and you usually see when you stop it, you will see a spark. And if you have a large inductor, and you suddenly try to disconnect it, you will see, a, if at some point, you will see a spark jump across it. Because as you try to cut the current, the voltage will build up, and at some point, enough you know, voltage will build up to break down the air and uh, form that largest spark. So that's one way I know there must have been energy stored here, because I'm pretty sure it takes energy to produce that spark. And well, there's no power supply. The only thing that was there was this current that was flowing. So, um, but you know, once again, it's not intuitive. So it's not intuitive exactly how that energy is there. So it's not easy to see. Um, well, for example, if we store energy, I guess this is the question that we ought to be able to answer. How much energy is there? 
So we can make the intuitive argument that there's some energy there, because the moment we try to break the circuit, we see that energy released. But the question now we want to ask is, OK, how much energy is stored there? How would you calculate it? Here, you see that it cancels out. So that in my final gener generally applicable expression, it doesn't depend on that amount of time either. It doesn't matter if it takes me a minute to charge the uh, inductor or a, you know, a year to charge the inductor. So uh, we did that. If I write out this uh, expression, it becomes 1 half L I naught squared. And when you look at this, I want you to be reminded of what you saw with capacitor. Because with the capacitor, this is what we had before. So this was the expression for energy stored. And using the definition of capacitance, we could actually rewrite this in two different ways. Right? Using you know, Q is equal to CV, we could rewrite this as 1 half CV squared. Or we could rewrite this as 1 half Q squared over C. Rem uh, notice this dynamic quantity squared. And in fact, this Q times V is still dynamic quantity squared, because both Q and V are dynamic. And here, I have the dynamic quantity current squared. That's somehow being a common feature. 